Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vineyardchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vineyardchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. Now here's this week's message. Oh, cool. Five bucks. Wait! What the? That's so weird. I thought I heard something. You did. You know what you should do? You should go and treat yourself to a frappuccino. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. What you really need to do is save for college your kids. College for your okay, kids. Okay, okay. Wait! Actually, you really need to be donating to charity. Tiny guys. It's great to be with you guys this morning. Before I get into my message, <clears throat> I just want to talk to you real briefly. As most of you guys know about Pastor Andy, he went into some surgery a couple of weeks ago. He had his knee reconstructed, I guess. Anyway, he has, he's doing great. He came through the surgery pretty good. It was a little more extensive than they thought, right? So he's been on bed rest for the past two weeks, complete bed rest. And I thought I was being helpful. I got him a little bell, put it there. I said, just sting it when you need me. Oh my God, <laughs> right, okay. So the bell has been removed. <laughs> and I'm encouraging him next week where he's gonna start rehab process for the next six weeks. So he would very much in, uh, appreciate your prayers for him, you know, that his recouping time, his rehabilitation will be quickly and smoothly and that his wife doesn't kill him <laughs> in the process, <clears throat> okay? All right, the second thing I want to bring up to you today is about the elections. Now, uh, I want to talk to you just real briefly. I'm not going to teach on it or anything. Uh, you know, if you want to know more about different concepts and positions that we have here at the church, then you can go to the polarized uh, series that Andy did a couple weeks ago. Take a look at that. It's on the website. You know, just uh, go to our website and call that up. Now, guys, the reason I bring it up is because in this rehab process with Andy and sitting with him, I've been watching a lot of TV, right? Which I don't normally do. And I can feel my blood pressure rising, right? And getting all worked up. And so I wanted to, to just remind you guys that we are children of the God Most High, which means we are to walk as examples and ambassadors out into the, uh, to the community in which we live in and, and to represent the characteristics of Jesus Christ. I don't care who you're, you're, you're voting for. We, that's not the be all and end all. As we were worshiping, the Lord dropped in my heart. You know, as I was worshiping, he said, no, I am faithful. I love this country as much as you do. And I have been faithful to her in the past and I will be faithful for her now and in her future. I want you to represent me, right? So I believe that's a word that the Lord dropped into my heart as we were worshiping, that indeed he wants us to carry the mantle that we have been given to be the hope of Christ to our community, especially during these turbulent times, okay? All right, would you bow your heads with me and I'm gonna open us in prayer. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father God, I invite your Holy Spirit, your presence into this room, Lord, that you would come and in every nook and cranny that you would be here. Father, that you would overcome the cold that I have today, that I could speak freely your words. And Father, that they could be heard and they could be understood. Father God, yeah, I hear that, not just uh, physically, but also spiritually. So Father, we know that we need to have a touch by you. And so I invite you here that you would touch each and every person looking for those answers today, Lord, that you would come and that you would I hear that you would encounter them. The Holy Spirit is here in a powerful way this morning. So Lord, would you be glorified in all that we have and all that we do? We love you so much. In Jesus' precious name, amen. 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 All right, guys. You know, as a Christ follower, right, we knew that when we accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior, what we were saying is we know that we have fallen short, right? We know that we have sinned and fallen short of a glorious God, of a holy God, 
And that's why he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die and to pay for our sins. When we accepted that truth into our lives, not only did we accept the forgiveness of, of, the, uh, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, but we also at that time asked him to be our leader, right? That he is to take the lead in our life, which means that he's to come in and to transform our thinking and our feelings and our actions. Is that not what the great commandment says, that we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, and with all our strength? Well, sure it is. So that's, that's what we do as Christ followers. And if you're here today because somebody invited you, right, <laughs> or you came in for whatever reason, and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, despite all that I say, the Lord Jesus has brought you here to know that you matter to him and that he loves you and he cares about you. And today I'll give you the opportunity to line your life up with him by accepting that salvation message that he offers you, that gift. And so I hope that you take that today. For those of us that have invited Christ to be the leader of our life, when we said, come Lord Jesus, Come be the leader of my life. That meant for everything. Our whole journey in our life is about following Jesus. It's about following his ways. And so he has to come in and transform, especially our thinking. And how is he going to do that? Through his word. That's how he does it, through his word. So in tackling a subject matter such as money, which is we're in a series called Money Talks, it's to help you to be encountered what the word of God has to say about it. You see, what the world says is different than what the Bible says. And so we need to be aware of what it says so that we can, you know, we can challenge ourselves. Now, all of you guys here are very intelligent people. So I'm going to present the gospel to you, the different aspects that I see for your consideration on these things. Last week we had, or the week before that, we had Pastor Jacob get up and he talked about when money talks, it says, serve me and love me, right? You guys remember that? He did a great job. He told us about how we have to be careful because money can become an idol for us, something that we can worship, something that can control our lives, right? And so he was saying, beware, be careful that that doesn't happen to you. Only learn to love the one true God and nothing else. And then Pastor Samuel Mead, he got up last week, and he says how money shouts and says, spend me, spend me, (laughs) right? It shouts at us about buying things all the time, about having out-of-control spending. And he brought in the wisdom that says, no, we need to really have control on our spending. We need to have a budget, you know, a budget plan so that we don't impulsively spend. Excellent, right? Well, today I don't want to talk about, I'm going to bounce off of Samuel's discussion where it says money shouting, you know, spend me. And I want to tell you about how money whispers, save me, save me, right? And I want to show you how you can turn up the internal mechanism inside of your heart so that you can actually hear this. Now, as I see it, when it comes to money, there's only two kinds of people in this world. There are the spenders and there are the savers, right? (laughs) It's only two. And in my home, I am the spender, right? And Andy's my saver. And uh, I love to shop. Nothing gives me more thrill than to get a good deal or something on sale. And one of my favorite times of the year is Black Friday. Oh, (laughs) don't judge me. Don't judge me. Let me tell you first, okay? I love Black Friday. Why? Because it's a time I hook in, you know, get up with my sisters. We have fun. You see, Thanksgiving, our family, all our extended families, we come together, and my sisters and I, we make a big meal, and then, we, you know, we have that with our family, and then we clean up. Girls, you know what that's like, right? So then we put on our clothes, and we get our papers out on our iPads, and we make a route, what we're going to do all night long, and we are going to shop, and we give ourselves permission to be silly and be girls. And so we go out, and we have a great time, you know, who's going to stand in line, who's going to get what, and so forth, and I really enjoyed it. Well, last year... You know, we had uh, uh, Sasha Brown. I don't know if you guys remember her. She was with Pastor with us a while ago. She flew in town, and so she came along with us. She goes, you guys have too much fun. So she came, and we got so carried away, though, we bought too much. <laughs> and so about 12, you know, 1 o'clock in the morning, we had any more room in our cars, right? So we call up uh, Pastor Debbie's husband, Lou, and said, couldn't you come pick up all our stuff? And you know, bless his heart, he picked it up, and he said to us when he was putting it in his car, he goes, you girls are saving so much money, you're going to drive me broke, or something like that. 
<laughs> He's hilarious if you know who I'm talking about. So, so anyway, so that, we've had a blast. And at 5 a.m., we actually had to call Andy again because we ran out of room. <laughs> you know, all those flowers we get up here, I get them on sale. So anyway, I'm justifying why I'm a spender, if you haven't figured that out. <laughs> so we've got, you know, anyway. Okay, so Andy has been uh, the saver in our family, and I am the spender. Now, to make me feel good, how many of you are spenders like me? Yay! Thank you, Jesus. Okay, how many of you are savers, right? Okay. Well, there are more spenders in this room than savers. And here's why. Because money yells, spend me, and it whispers, save me right? And so again, today I want to talk to you about some things I have learned about how to be a saver, right? How to answer that. So let's look at this whole concept about saving. Let's look at that. And first, is gonna, I'm going to take you to places you never thought you'd go, okay? First, I'm going to take you to theological question about what is savings and should we save it, okay? It's a spiritual question. It's on your outline. Pull that out. It says, should, I, should a Christian save money? Okay, should a Christian save money? Now, again, how many of you think, well, that's a no-brainer. Of course you should save money. Raise your hand. Let me see. Well, all of you almost, right? You're thinking, duh, why is she teaching that? Well, because I believe that the scriptures show us that, yes, savings, and yes, yes, uh, that we shouldn't save. And so you get both of these things going on. And so I want to challenge you to use your cognitive skills, your thinking skills, your reasoning skills today to come up with this concept of should you save or not, okay? So let's look at our scriptures here. First, it says, should a Christian save money? Yes. I'm going to answer the positive yes. So we would look at verses like this. Proverbs 6, 6 and 8, it says, Go to the ant, you sluggard. <laughs> Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler. Yet it stores its provisions in summer and <clears throat> gathers its food in the harvest, okay? So what the scripture is saying is, <clears throat> learn from the ant. The ant doesn't have a boss, and the ant knows what it's supposed to do. The ant knows it's supposed to save for the future, and if an ant can get it, it's not rocket science. You should be able to get it, right? <laughs> Nature teaches us that we need to store. Okay, then Proverbs 21, 2 says, <clears throat> in the house of the wise are stores of choice food and oil, but a foolish man devours all he has. And so what this is saying is that, A, a fool spends every dime they make. A wise person stores it up, correct? Okay, and then we have stories in the Bible, like I'll just pull out one, Joseph, right? You know how Joseph saved all of Egypt. Why? Joseph saved Egypt because he had enough foreknowledge to know that in the years of plenty that he was to save for the years of want, right? A great example of the wisdom of, of saving, so you're like, okay, okay, I get that. I know that. Well, let's go. Should a Christian save money? No. Let's look at our scriptures, right? We might use a scripture like this in Matthew 6, 19. <clears throat> Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust will destroy <clears throat> and where thieves break in and steal. These are Jesus' words right here. He says, hey, don't store for yourselves treasures on earth. Is that not, you know, savings? Well, sure. Can they not be reconciled? Some people think they can't. The next scripture here, Matthew 6, 34, it says, Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So what it's saying here is that to worry about what's going to happen tomorrow is a behavior that God doesn't want us to do. So he instructs us not to worry. So why should we worry about saving for another time? And then Jesus says here in Luke 12, 21, he says, this is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not, but is not, but is not rich towards God. Now this statement here, I plucked it out. Let me give you the background of what's happening. Jesus is talking about a rich man here. He's talking about the rich man who made it his life's perspective and goal to accumulate as much as he possibly could. So he built the barns to house all the grains he was making, you know, and he was a very successful businessman. And then he says this, the businessman, he goes, I have so much. I have plenty of good things for many years. Now I can take life easy. I can eat, drink, and be merry. <laughs> Does that not sound like the American dream? <laughs> it does, doesn't it? It sounds like the American dream here. 
you know, to get rich, right? To store money for yourself and goods, and then you can retire to the good life, right? To the good life. But this is what happened to our rich man. This is what God said. You fool, this very night I demand your life. Whew. And who will get your riches? And so we, are, we read that, and then we read this verse 21, where it said, this is how it will be for anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich towards God, right? And so there's this caution about being careful about saving up and amassing this wealth, right? You have to leave it all here. So there's this caution that's coming out. And then, if I haven't convinced yet, there's one more scripture here, right, for you to think about. James 5, 1 through 3, it says this. Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you. Your wealth has rotten, and your moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and your silver have corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Now let me make sure you understand what's going on here. Moths don't eat our clothes when we wear them, right? It's when we store them, when we put them up. And gold and silver doesn't get corroded when you're using it. It's when you hoard it and you, you shove it away and you hide it. That's where it gets corroded. <clears throat> and so what's happening here, the rich people are storing their food, their clothes, and stuff like that. They're focused on the future, what's going to happen. And because they're so focused on that, they have totally ignored the people around them that are suffering, that are in great need. They have ignored that. And God judged this rich, the rich people. Do you see that? He judged them, and he found them wanting, and he found them guilty. Wow. So then I pose back that same question. Should a Christian be saving? Yes or no? These are not, it's not an easy as just, oh, of course. You have to wrestle with what the scriptures are saying. You have to look at them and you have to hold them in tandem before the Lord and you ask for the Holy Spirit to give you wisdom to know what the answer is for you. Now, I put a solution down here that I see. The solution I see is this, and it's number three on your outline. It is wise to save money for the future needs. It's wise, but not to, to selfishly hoard, not to selfishly hoard. You see, there's this balance that God wants us to achieve. He wants us to know that, that there is there's a wisdom to uh, saving money and, and having that for future needs because there will be things that you will need that are expected and unexpected. He says, be careful because on the other side, we can become so consumed with having the biggest, the best retirement that we forget about why we're here. We lose our focus. And so there's this call to come into the radical middle, to find balance in our lives when we are working with our money in terms of saving it. And so I put forth this balance is something that you and I need to find. We need to know what that is. Because to error means that we don't really take into account that God says that you and I are to be salt and light to the world. We're to be the ones that stand up for social justice. We're the ones to help the people that are in plight. And yet we are to take care of ourselves. So there's this radical middle, this balance that we must figure out where we land. And I can't tell you where yours is. Only you can. And if you have this personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you can go to before him and you can talk to him and he will help you to figure out what that balance is. Now I have found to find this balance, this is your next point we're going into, is going to require you to have the right attitude when you come before the Lord. Well, what's the right attitude? Well, let me show you what I have learned. The right attitude is first that God owns everything. That he owns everything. In 1 Corinthians 10, 26, Paul is reminding us of something that was said in the Old Testament. He's reminding us in the New Testament. He says this, the earth, is, the earth is the Lord's and everything, circle that, and everything in it. So everything around us belongs to the Lord. That means not just all our money and our resources and our things. It means our relationships also. It means all that we have, it belongs to the Lord, Right? And so with this idea, because it's so hard, because we think I'm the one who worked really hard to get that money, right? I'm the one who went and found the house or got the car or whatever. I have found it very helpful to walk around from time to time. And I'll just walk around. I'll go, oh, Lord, 
Thank you for letting me live in your house. What do you want to do with your house? Thank you for letting me borrow your car to get to where I'm going today. Can I put gas in your car? You know? And so you start, you start looking at it from a different lens. You know, when I get my paycheck, it's no longer what do I want to do. It's what do you want to do with it, Lord? What do you want to do with this? And so we have this idea of everything belongs to the Lord, and we need to make sure that we keep that in our forefront of our mind. And what I'm saying is easy to go, sure, 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 but it's very hard to do. Give me that, right? You know, a good example of this is when uh, Pastor Andy and I started this church over 23 years ago, right? We started it with a handful of people. And it was just a little fledgling of the church. And, and so it didn't have money to keep its pastor and pay its rent and do ministry. So we made a decision that Andy would quit his job and give his full attention to the church, and I would work. I would continue to do my profession, and I would take care of the family, which meant Andy and the three kids financially, right? I kept the insurance and stuff like that. Well, uh, my salary was, was made it very tight to take care of the kids and, and all the things that we had going on at the time. It was really hard. I mean, there were times when we were on food stamps, okay? And that we had to, be, we belonged to a co-op that had what they called a, a food share, where we would go on the weekends to the local grocer, and they would put out the food that was going bad, the fruits and vegetables, and they let us choose. I can remember when we were picking through that bin. I thought, oh God, I was picking through that bin. I looked at it. I said, if you would have told me that I, with a master's degree, who worked my butt off, would be picking through <laughs> poor fruit, I would have told you you were nuts, right? It was so hard, and I tell you how hard it was so that you can understand the next part of this story, not to feel sorry for me, okay? The next part of our story is this. When I was working at school, I was finishing up that day. I was getting ready because I was going to do tutoring to bring in some extra money, and here comes Andy. He pops into, the, into, the, um, into my classroom. He goes, hey, you got a minute? I need to speak to you. I was like, sure, right? I'm like, sure. He goes, you know, we've been praying about how we can more effectively um, touch our community for Jesus Christ. And we've been praying, how do you want us to do this, Lord? He goes, well, I feel like I got a plan, Sharon. I thought, well, fantastic. Let me hear your plan. And see, before I married Andy, I was in the business world. So when I looked at it, I thought, God, this is a great plan. But how much is it going to cost us? And he said, $10,000. I went, 10000 I knew our little church didn't have it. I'm like, where are you going to get the money? He goes, well... I want to use our savings. I thought, you got to be kidding. Even when I say that, I can feel my jelly. You know how your legs just go jelly? I was like, oh my gosh. You know, and I think Andy could feel my panic because he quickly said, let's pray. Wow, that's a good idea, right? That's a good idea. You know, so we started to pray, and I really needed to hear God, and I just cried. I was like, God, please, if this is where you want to go, I want to follow you, but you have to give me peace. And my God, you've got to give me courage, wow. right? right? Got to give me courage to step this out. And sure enough, you know how you have that quiet voice deep down inside? Uh -huh. And it said, follow me, Sharon, uh -huh. follow me. And so that day I made the decision, I'm going to follow. So we said our amens. I looked at Annie and said, yeah, that's from the Lord. Go ahead and take it all out, all 10,000 of it, and I want you to give it to the church. Mm -hmm. And that's what he did. Now, why would somebody give up their savings when they know they're going to need it <laughs> not too long, right? This is a crapshoot. Is it going to work or not? Why would you do that? Because what I didn't realize at the time now was God was teaching me that the 10000 was his. Right. It's always been and always will be his, and he was redirecting it, and he wanted to see if I would follow him and be his manager, yeah. Yeah. that I would be his servant, that wouldn't put my needs above what he was telling me I was to do with it. Yeah, now, in this process, I also learned a second attitude that we had to have. It's to trust God to provide. That we need to trust God in our provision. I have learned that God will take care of you. All my life, I have not been without. Ever since I've been following the Lord, he has always met my needs. Not always my wants. And as I have matured, I've been able to separate him, but he has always met my needs. Now, here's an example. Um, I was talking to the Lord when my kids were little. They're all a year and a half apart, very close. 
And so I had them all like stair steps. And as an educator, my heart was so moved. I wanted to have them in preschool when they were three and four. It was important to me. But I knew that we had no money. So I was praying. I was like, Lord, here's my heart, but it's up to you, right? And I'll, I'll be dead on. God worked in such a, a fantastic way. He had my mom come and help me with childcare. And how many of you know that childcare is just horrifically expensive, right? <laughs> yes. Well, when she came in to help me, that relieved the funds there. And then uh, Andy's grandmother passed away, gave money to his mom, and she gave some to us, enough to cover preschool, <laughs> right? God provided. And I, I know it seems so little and so trite, but let me tell you, it meant the world. It meant the world to me because it spoke to my heart and said, I am faithful. It's like her songs. I am faithful. I've been faithful to you. Now remember this. And I tell you, that memory has carried me into the present day where I stand before you. And I know when I'm looking at something and it requires a lot of faith, I look back and say, God, you provided there. You're going to provide for me today. And you are my hope for the future. So you can almost see that bouncing, can't you? And so God wants to develop these things in us as his servants. Now, in Matthew 6, 25 and 26, Jesus says this, Do not worry, worry, saying, What shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you have need of them. But, here we go, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. And so there's this call to have an attitude that seeks his kingdom, his will over and beyond what you think you have, that you want your will, right? And to know that, that it all belongs to him. He is faithful to provide. Let him lead you. That's the point there. Let him lead you. Have this right attitude when you're trying to find the balance between I want to spend it, I want to save it, and I need to be able to give some away because that's a, what a Christ follower does. See that? All right. So I want to end this time with you by giving you some practical things that you can do for saving. So I've taken a whack at it. It's on your outline. So let's just quickly look at these things. The first one is I believe that <clears throat> to save money is a discipline in of itself. And I know that I'm not a very disciplined person sometimes. And so I need to have the help of the Holy Spirit. And so there's this uh, scripture in Galatians 5, 22, 23. It's called the fruit of the Spirit, right? And so the Holy Spirit's trying to work in us to do his will. And one of the fruits that he is working in us is this whole idea of self-discipline, right? Self-discipline. And so when you want to do something like save, you need to call upon the power of the Holy Spirit to come into your life to help you to have that, that, that power to do that. The second thing, after you've prayed and you've asked the Holy Spirit to empower you with self-control, the second one is to step into savings, just to do something, to make a step towards it. You see, if you spend all the money you make, right, you're never going to be able to save. If you, if you make, you know, 300, uh, let's say, a week, and you decide to spend 300, there's never going to be any margin, right? Or for most of us that are sitting here, we make 300 and we want to spend 350 and we put it on the charge card, right? And so we know that to step towards saving means that we don't do that. We don't do that. We make that decision. I'm not going to do that. I have 300. I'm not going to go beyond that. So we set limits for ourselves. Stepping towards savings is something like this. If I have my budget and I want to increase it because I want to buy something, maybe uh, like a, a newer car or something, right? Or some clothes. And I'm going to increase my budget by a certain amount of money. Well, that means I'm going to have to make that money to adjust that for that extra amount, right? Makes sense? But it's not dollar for dollar for savings. What happens is not only do I have to make the money that I need, but I have to do beyond that because I have to pay taxes on it, right? And then I'm going to have to give a tithe if I make extra money on that to represent that. And in the end, it gets it costs me more money to, to try to use my budget to raise my amounts that I'm making to compensate for what I want. Instead, I'm going to suggest that you lower your budget for the thing that you want. Why? Because dollar for dollar, you know, it, it works better. You don't have to earn beyond that because there's not the extra tithe in taxes. Yeah. Well, what do you mean exactly, Sharon? Let me get real practical. If I had to raise my budget by $100, right? Then I'm not going to have to just earn, earn $100. I have to earn 
uh, 15% more for taxes and 10% more for tithing. And so my $100 now becomes I have to make $134 to do that. Whereas if I wanted to buy that thing that was $100, adjust my budget over here, right? If I went and found some factors I could get rid of and lower it by 100, then that's all I have to do. Not 134, just 100, right? I know you're thinking, God, I can't believe she's doing this too early in the morning, right? <laughs> okay, well, here you go. How do, we, how do we reduce our budget? Well, I'm going to suggest that you go in and that you look for places to lower it by what I'm going to call the latte theory, right? What, what do you mean latte theory, Sharon? Well, the latte theory is something I read by a man. His name is David Beach, and he's a financier, right? And so I was reading some of his material, and he was telling a story about a lady named Kim that he had met. She came to one of his seminars, and she said, oh, I cannot save. My budget's just too tight. There's nowhere, you know, I can cut and stuff like that. And he said, okay, well, let's just talk. He goes, tell me about your day. And so Kim starts to tell David about her day, and she goes, well, I go to work. He goes, just, you go right to work? She goes, oh, no, 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 I go and get a cup of coffee. Not a normal cup of coffee, right? She goes and gets a double non-fat latte, <laughs> and it costs her three fifty. dollars And of course, she has to have her brand muffin when she gets that coffee, so, you know, that's another $1.75. Now, before she's even got to work, she spent $5. And then when she gets to work, you know, she has her mid-morning break, right? So she spends another $3.95 for her energy drink because she has to have that, you know, to keep going, and another $1.75 for, you know, for the, uh, the power bar that goes with it so she gets that boost, <laughs> all right? Now, she hasn't even had lunch, and she's already spent $11. So David just kind of stops her right there and says, okay, Kim, let me just propose this. He took his little calculator out, and he says, just suppose out of the $11 that you have spent, that we save five of those dollars. So I'm going to say, skip the latte and the bran muffin, okay? And we're gonna save the five dollars because that's what they add up to. And you do that every day, that's $150 per month. And we multiply that out per year and that's $1,800, right? And he said, how old are you, Kim? And Kim says, I'm 23 years old. And he says, do you want to retire when you're, you know, 65? She says, yes. He goes, if you saved and invested that $1,800 and you invested it in a 10% return in the stock market over those many years, which is 30 some years, and the average rate, guys, is usually 10%. So if you invested that over the 30 years, then at age 65, how much money do you think you'd have? Of course, Kim, it's like most of us, I don't know, 100,000 maybe, right? He goes, no, you will have $1.2 million. And she's like, holy cow, you mean my latte's costing me $1.2 million? <laughs> latte factor, right? The latte factor. Listen, guys, <clears throat> what happened here is the compounding interest. Most of us are acquainted with the compounding interest when we get our credit card and we swipe it. And you know how hard that thing is to pay, right? If you don't pay it all off, it's like it has a life of its own. <laughs> And we're on the negative side. Well, what if we got on the positive side of that? That's what I'm talking about when you save. Now I know this latte factor, I didn't pick a spiffy name, did I? It's because I want you to remember latte factor, latte factor. Then some of you might go, well, I don't drink coffee. I believe that every one of us has a latte factor in here. It might look different. It might be soda, candy, right? It might, you know, it might be cigarettes, it might be alcohol. Could even be eating out. Could be cable TV, right? Going from the regular to the premium to the whatever, right? Or it could be iPhones. Gotta have that seven, right? So we all have a latte factor. You gotta figure out what it is. You gotta figure out what it is. At least you are sitting in my audience and you're saying, I'm just too old. It doesn't mean that I can do this. Uh uh. No, compound interest knows no time limit. Okay, you can jump on this thing. It can make sense. It can make sense. So will you forgo $5 a purchase, you know, purchase today so that you can have a million dollars later on? It's like a no-brainer, of course, right? So that's one practical, very practical example of how we can save. The other is that there are classes that we offer here. Samuel talked about those last week, like financial peace, right? And there are people here that understand how to, how to set up accounts and things like that. And those are things that are given to you. Take advantage. Jump in there. Look at those. 
And then another example is to be courageous to set up a budget. I am amazed at how many people do not work with a budget, right? They just don't have it. Matter of fact, my premarital counseling, I require uh, as part of that is that they develop a budget for the two of them, that they have individual ones and then they do one corporately. And, and most people don't even know how to. I give them a form to help them. So I want to encourage you to start to go towards the budget. And yeah, you might fall off it. You probably will. But so what? It's just guide rails. Okay, it's going to help you to start to move in the direction you need to. And then this next one here, pay yourself first. And I crossed it out. And I put second, right? Because I was looking at this about paying yourself. And I thought, well, gosh, you, you shouldn't be first because God is first. And God's word says, bring him the first, not the second, not the third, but the first fruits of your labor. And so that's what we are to do. We're to bring it to the Lord. And then secondly, we pay ourselves. What does that look like? And so that's where that saving would come in. Now, if you think I'll pay all my bills and save, you'll never have enough money. You just won't. It doesn't work out that way. And so I encourage you to put, you know, savings before paying yourself. Now, a great example, what I'm talking about, you've heard Pastor Andy talk about it, something that we use in our home, and it's called the 10-10-80 plan. 10-10-80, easy. 10% goes to the Lord, you know, 10% goes to our savings, and we live off the 80%. Now, to help us to be successful, to help yourselves to be successful, you need to put in play some kind of a system, all right? And the type of system that I'm going to advocate is something that is automatically done for you, okay? To do that 10 and 10 I was talking about. Uh, what, what the idea behind this one comes from watching the government, okay? I work with the finances in our church, and I have realized that uh, the government is very smart, about getting their money, about paying themselves. You know, it didn't always used to be where they would deduct the money that they wanted from you, like for Social Security, taxes, you know, the Medicaid, right, the unemployment. All that comes out of most people's check, and you don't even see it. You don't even miss it. They take it out first. But like I said, it didn't used to be like that. In 43, 1943, the government would let you pay your taxes in the spring. But what they found is people were so undisciplined to do that that Nobody could pay their taxes. And so they, they were looking at, do we, bring, do we start to build debt or prison? <laughs> you know, or do we go in and help the people with their undisciplined behavior? And so they came in, and that's when they decided to, uh, you know, take those taxes out before you ever see it. I think they were on to something. Not that I like the government taking my money. <laughs> but they're on to something about this automatic deduction. And so if we would set up our finances to have monies go in certain directions, automatically, then we don't forget, then we don't not have it at the end. So something that Andy and I have done is we've set up when our monies come into the bank that the bank already knows to pay these bills. And one of them that they pay is that 10%. It comes to the church um, every month. It's just shot off here. And then we take 10% and that's put in our savings. And then we live off the 80. So when we look at our account, we go, whoa, it's 80% of what we have to, that's our 100% that we're going to live on to do the things we want to do. So when we make something automatic like that, it helps, it helps us to stay in the straight and narrow. Now, if you're going, well, that's great, but I have no money. <laughs> I can't go the 10, 10, 80. Try 2, 2, and 80, right? I think that you need to be in compliance or you need to show the Lord that he is first and that you understand that by giving him 10%. But I just want you to move off the mark you're in. You know, just move towards him. Set up something, even if it feels small. Remember, $5 turned into $1.2 million by the time that girl was 65. Guys, little amounts of money add up and your money is going to yell at you, spend me. And it whispers to us, save me. And it's my prayer that you would be wise enough to hear that whisper and to respond appropriately. Now stand up. I'm going to close this in prayer. Can I have the um, prayer team come on down front? All right. Yes. Okay, I am aware of the time. But you see, I know I can talk and talk and talk. But there's nothing like the Holy Spirit that can come in and galvanize and put the flashlight on the thing that's in your soul. 
And so we're going to give him a few minutes, and we're going to let him do that. And then if things come up and you want extra prayer, that's why these people are here. There's nothing special about them except for that they love the Lord, and they're here as your friends to be able to pray with you through whatever. I hear that. Finances are the number one reason that people get divorced. They fight over that. It's so hard. And so if you're struggling with your marriage today, I felt like the Lord just dropped that in my heart, that you want prayer. You want people to walk with you and to pray with you over that. Okay? Yeah. All right, bow your heads with me. Thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you have been in this room, Lord, that you have been moving this whole time. And so, Father, just as I, I, I anticipated that you would be here, that you would bring, yeah, I see that, thirsty souls. God says that those who are thirsty, in your soul, you're thirsty for answers. God says that he is the only answer that you need. So, Father, I ask that you would come and that you would clarify that for them, Lord. Where they have been running, I see that, where they've been running to and fro and you're running and running. God says, stop, sit down and invite me into your problems. Father, I love you. I thank you that your presence is here. Yeah. And there are some of you, again, that you've been invited here today. Uh Uh-huh. And you're not sure about your relationship with Christ. Matter of fact, you're like, whoa. This is kind of scary. Listen, the Lord loves you. He brought you here because you matter. He cares deeply for you. He loves you. But he also lets you have free choice. And you can hear the name of Jesus all you want. But until you accept him as your Lord and Savior and ask him to forgive your sins and to be the leader of your life, he doesn't push himself on you. But he's wooing you today. And so I'm going to lead you in a prayer for those of you that don't have this relationship and want that. I'm going to pray for you to receive Christ right now. And all the people in here that have done that, you be praying because there are people here that don't know Christ, that don't know him the way you do. So for those of you that want to establish that relationship, I hear that Father says, come home. Come home, I've been waiting. If you want to respond, yes, you just pray this prayer right where you're at right now. You just say, Father God, I don't understand everything but I'm responding to your call and I'm coming home. Jesus, I ask you to be the forgiver of my wrong choices. And I ask you to be the leader of my life the best way that I know how I'm reaching. And I'm going to pray for those that prayed that prayer. Father, I thank you that you seal that precious prayer in their heart and that it's not them that means to, they don't don't have to take it forward. God says he's going to take it forward for you. And so Father has just said that he has written your book in the, your name in the book of life and you are a child of the God most high. So Father, I thank you for those that made that decision today. I thank you, Father, for that. And Lord, I ask that you would give them a good home. If it's not here, that you would direct them to a place where they can go, a body of believers that they can be with and that they can grow with. And Lord, for this whole discussion on saving and spending and giving of the finances that you entrust us, as a believer, Lord, I ask that you would break through the lies of the enemy that would cause us not to hear and not to be transformed in our thinking I thank you, Lord, that you lay out scriptures because you treat us not as little babies, but you give us meat as as grown-ups, as as adults, so that we can make those decisions with you, Lord, that you direct us and that you love us enough to present before us the truth and say, where will you land? And so, Father, now I ask that each, I see that each mind, each heart, that heard it would be impacted, not just with words, but with the power of the Holy Spirit and that they would be able to rise up and have you, Lord God, as their strength to make their behaviors match up with what your word says, Lord. Yes, Father, shake them out of the complacency. Yes, 
cause them, Lord, to run to you and you alone. Thank you, Father. Uh Uh-huh. Faithfulness. Father says he has been faithful in the past. He will be faithful for today, no matter how dark it feels. There's somebody here, it's very dark where you're at. God says he sees. And God says if you will invite him in to where you are right now, that his light is enough to illuminate everything, even the, even the places of great pain. He says you have to walk through. It's like the Red Sea, that he's parting it for you, but you have to walk through it. Father, I thank you that you are giving us uh, words of revelation and of knowledge, Lord. I thank you that you care for us. And so, Lord, I ask that you would continue to bless those that came forward uh, for prayer also, Lord. Give the prayer warriors words of knowledge, words of of, uh, power, Father, that you want to, to endow them with to speak to people. I thank you, Lord, that they're part of what you're doing today. And so we will honor you, Father, with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul, with every breath of life you've given us. For you are worthy. You are so worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks for listening to this week's message. We hope you enjoyed it. Don't hesitate to write us your story at amen at And we'll see you next week.